Hi, everybody. Welcome back. As promised, we are going to take a look at um, the lifestyle of our species. But of course, before we get there, I want to just make a quick note about the climate because the upper paleolithic is going to bring in the end of the last ice age as well as some pretty severe temperature fluctuations um, up until about 10,000 years ago. So this is a period of time referred to as the upper paleolithic that is generally characterized by glacial melting. The last glacial maximum, which is a phrase uh, that we use for the last, uh, the, the maximum amount of ice that existed during this period of time, maxes out at about 22,000 years ago. This is severe climate uh, in the north, severe Arctic climate. Neanderthals are gone. Um, well, you know, more than gone during this time, um, but we are just getting started in Europe. There are a few periods of time. Don't worry, I will not ask you about these on the quiz, but I did want to um, you know, introduce them to give you a sense of what these fluctuations look like. The first is called the Allerod Oscillation, um, and that is when we had temperatures that were very similar to what they are today from about 14,700 years ago for about 2,000 years until 12,800 years ago. We then enter into a dramatic switch in climate where we go back to subarctic conditions again from about 12,800 years to about 11,500 years ago. And that is at the end of that uh, 1,300 years is when we see a, a big warming again, um, warmer than we even see today. Um, and that happens until about 8,500 years ago until we get back to the climates that we're familiar with today. And keep in mind um, that this is the period of time, this drying trend is going to be what leads to the development of cereal grains in the environment and ultimately will lead to our species domesticating agriculture. Now, what's interesting is that Homo sapiens are driven out of Europe during this last glacial maximum. We are leaving Europe during these horrendous Arctic conditions, but we're shifting back in before it really gets all that good. Um, you know, we're still, we, we leave during the most, the last glacial maximum, but we're working our way back in still while it is Arctic. Um, and how are we surviving these conditions? Because we certainly are not built for it the way Neanderthals are. So we're gonna talk about culture, right? But um, what are we eating? So upper Paleolithic megafauna is changing dramatically. By about 15,000 years ago, the large game that we're dependent on, that Neanderthals were dependent on especially, are going to be going extinct and replaced with smaller games. So mammoth, thousands of pounds of mammoth, bison, these big animals, buffalo, are going to go extinct in exchange for smaller game like rabbits. Mass extinctions are going to be probably very important to the survival of our species over Neanderthals, who did not appear to have adapted to this smaller game, whereas we did. Um, and lots of evidence is found in the fossil record of how Homo sapiens hunted and gathered. Um, with this switch to small game, we're seeing all sorts of new innovations pop up, um, including snares, traps, and net hunting. Um, net hunting of small you know, prey has a big return. Um, you can get more, right? And you don't have to put, you don't have to expend very much energy, but it does require communal strategizing because you have to make that net. You have to collect all the materials for that net. You have to bring that net to a location, leave it, trap it, bring it back. So the fact that um, we are net hunting suggests definitely some communal hunting strategies among our species. Um, finally, we appear to be fishing as well, and we don't see evidence of other species taking advantage of fish, which are going to be an, uh, an incredibly important resource um, for our brains. These are some of the oldest fish hooks in the world. Um, these were found in Okinawa in 20, uh, uh, 23,000 years old. Now note here, um, I won't ask you about the majority of the upper paleolithic tool trends um, by name or date. But what I do want you to notice is um, just how diverse the upper paleolithic tool traditions are and how rapidly they're changing comparatively to other 
traditions at the time. So we have the Oldowan and Acheulean traditions. Those are the only traditions used for well over a million years each. The Mousterian tradition um, is going to stay relatively the same during the Middle Paleolithic for Neanderthals and Archaic humans. But by about 30,000 to 33,000, let's say up to 50,000 years ago or so, um, we're going to start to see some, some dramatic diversification in types of tools. Um, they're adapting and changing so quickly that we have four separate tool traditions from the Upper Paleolithic for our species. Bows and arrows are being developed during this time. These are South African finds, 64,000 year old arrowheads. Um, they appear to have been shaped um, into arrows using a heating process um, to chip them properly um, and then attached with a form of sticky glue substance. Our stone tool technology is called blade flaking, and it is absolutely the most efficient method of creating stone flakes so far. This is what we call an Arignacian blade, excuse me. It's a 30,000 year old pickups, of course. Blade flake from Southern France. Notice how thin, how long this particular flake is. This is used um, or made with a method called punch flaking. And as you can see kind of demonstrated in this image here, um, punch flaking refers to taking slivers of the stone, um, kind of working circularly around that stone. But the clincher is that instead of cracking stone on stone, which is going to be very hard to control, it's gonna be very hard to predetermine where things are gonna break, where fractures are going to occur, um, Homo sapiens are going to start using bone on stone and bone on stone is going to allow us to get um, to have a greater amount of predictability in terms of what we're making size shape um, and it's going to allow us to get these thin blade flake slivers which are going to be um, easily sharpened and extremely sharp themselves to begin with. They are also incredibly efficient. Look at the efficiency of blade flaking. For every pound of stone, a blade flake can get 10 to 39 feet of usable cutting edge. That is compared to an Oldowan tool of Homo habilis. One pound of stone gives only two inches of cutting edge, two inches to 39 feet. That is a dramatic difference in efficiency, 1200% more efficient method of getting this cuttable um, edge and a whole lot less effort going into it as well. So what we're gonna see is not only are we increasing the efficiency of our tools, but as a consequence of that, we are getting a little bit more free time. And that might make sense of some of these other trends we're gonna see here soon. Few other things we're doing to our tools. Look at this pressure flaking example. And you can see from the infograph here um, that we're putting a little bit of pressure on the edge um, in order to get a serrated edge. Serrated edges like these and the toggles that have been cut into these toggle head bone spears are going to be very important to killing an animal, dropping it very quickly. Um, and so we're gonna do more damage with a toggle, with a serrated edge, which means instead of having to track an animal for many, many hours after you have wounded it, the animal's gonna drop immediately. Um, this is going to save you a lot of time and effort. It's also gonna ensure that you can get your weapon back um, if you've speared from a long distance, let's say. Speaking of long distances, um, we are also the first species that uses bone tip spears and bone is light, it's hollow. Um, and so it is going to move through the air at a greater velocity um, and be much sharper. So Homo sapiens would use like a limestone, um, sandstone to shape bone into almost like a bullet-like tip, um, keeping the spears very light. We're also going to see tools um, for making tools. Now this is a shaft straightener. This is a tool that was designed to put the shaft of the spear right in this opening. And then you're gonna grab onto it and move it up and down like this, hoping to, to, to make the, um, the shaft as straight as possible. The straighter the shaft, the greater the velocity you're going to achieve, the more likely you are to make a kill 
from long distance. Let's add one more hunting advancement to our spear, and that is going to be the spear thrower. Um, the spear thrower is something you're going to hold under um, the spear with the butt of the spear uh, being right at the nose of this carving. Notice this beautiful carving on the end of this spear thrower. And you're going to hold both of them together like this, right? So imagine that my pen at the bottom here is the spear thrower and the spear is on top and I'm gonna hold them together like this. And when I throw, right, I'm gonna stop this force and that's going to cause the spear to project forward. But what the butt end here of the spear thrower is doing is it's almost acting like a third force um, to push that spear forward, which with, uh, the bone tip spear can send the spear up to 93 miles an hour using stored energy and it's increasing velocity. So you are going to penetrate because especially from long distance, remember that Neanderthals were getting up close and personal and stabbing a mammoth literally from its side. But Homo sapiens, we're increasing the distance between ourselves and the animals that we're hunting. We're increasing the safety of hunting. Um, and we're doing that by developing weapons we can throw and use from afar. But if you're going to do that, you need them to move with a great amount of velocity, with a great amount of force, so that when they hit the animal, they actually penetrate through the skin, the fat, the bone, the musculature into the organs, which will then drop that animal so that, again, you don't have to track it for very long. All of these traditions are starting to develop among Homo sapiens. Um, and as a result of it, we are really getting our food with a great amount of ease. And um, perhaps as a result of that are some very important social changes. So you had an article called The Evolution of Grandparents. And what that article talks about is the increasing life expectancy rates of our species during the upper Paleolithic. We're living longer, we're having more children, our population sizes are becoming larger. But additionally, it's not just parent and child living, we're actually seeing grandparents, we're seeing people live long enough to be grandparents. And so in the article, um, the author analyzes Fossilized teeth of hundreds of individuals spanning 3 million years, indicating that living long enough to reach grandparenthood um, became common relatively late in human evolution. Um, they assessed, the author and her colleagues assessed the proportion of older adults relative to younger adults in these four groups here and found that the ratio increased only modestly over the course of evolution um, until about 30,000 years ago when it skyrocketed. So um, the number of red individuals are those that live to old age or the age we would call the potential for grandparenthood. Um, and so 15, they were using the age of 15 as the age of, of menses. So this is probably when uh, we're having our first babies, which means that by the age of 30, you are living to see your grandchild. So those are the ages they're looking for. Notice that not very many australopithecines are surviving to 30, a few more early homo, a few more Neanderthals, but a dramatic growth for early modern European humans. Um, for 10 Neanderthals under 30 that were dead, um, there were about four who lived beyond 30. Compared to Homo sapiens in the upper Paleolithic Europe, for every 30 that were dead, 20 lived beyond the age of 30. So big, huge difference. Five times more individuals are living beyond the age of 30 by 30,000 years ago. Um, and so the author addresses a couple reasons why this might be. Environment is obviously going to be very important. This was mostly true in temperate climates. In areas of the world that were experiencing harsh climates still, we saw uh, life expectancies similar to that of Neanderthals and earlier species. So having an ease of environment is going to be very important here. Um, but so is culture. Culture is going to be, and all of the things that we've looked at so far, are going to be very important in allowing us to live longer, healthier lives um, and, and um, allowing for people to live beyond 30 to then participate as grandparents. So the question is, is well, who cares, right? Why, why would it matter? Why would it make such a big difference in the survival of our species that we have three generations living at a time? And so your article looks at a few bits of, of evidence, right? Um, 
look at the differences in our tools. Look at these middle Paleolithic tools of Neanderthals at the time, and look at the kind of um, vast differences that we've seen just so far, um, the complexity of our tools, the sophisticated art, all of those things start to appear uh, culturally during the um, upper Paleolithic. And so your article, The Evolution of Grandparents, talks about grandparents playing a few important roles. One, and pro pro probably the most important is, is teaching, right? Um, passing down information. Two, childcare, right? Imagine parents being able to leave, go do the hunting, go do some of these dangerous activities, the gathering, and still have their children protected by grandparents during this time. Um, this may make sense of why our population sizes outpace Neanderthals um, so dramatically. Very few of them are living to this age. Um, and since both males and females appeared to be involved in those intense subsistence methods, those dangerous subsistence methods, it's likely that a lot of those children may have been orphaned. Um, in fact, that's maybe how they were integrated into homo sapien cultures. So um, having grandparents around is, is probably going to allow for culture to expand at a much more dramatic rate. And that's what we see in these other bits of evidence I wanna show you here. So tool making, uh, tools for making tools, a needle. This is the oldest needle we have. Um, I imagine there's more out there, but as you know, they're difficult to find, but this is a 25,000 year old needle made from a splinter of bone that's then polished with a sandstone. Um, and then a small stone drill would be used to bore a small hole through it so that you can then pull through um, the thread, which could have been anything from dried out animal tendon in the sun um, to plant material, right? Things like that. So homo sapiens are making clothes. Perhaps they're doing uh, surgical techniques. We aren't sure. We're also making art. Um, these are Venus figurines. We saw one Venus figurine out of Africa already that was well over 100,000 uh, years old and um, from another species entirely um, that kind of carved out the female form. These are classically known as Venus figurines. Um, the most classic one, if you take an art history or anything like that, cultural anthropology, you may have seen the one on the left. This is the Venus of Willendorf. Uh, it's an Austrian example made out of limestone. Um, on the right, we have the Venus of Lespugue from France. Um, both about 24 to 26,000 years old. Now we see figurines like these all around the world. And what's interesting is, while there's obviously great differences between how they were carved, there are some similarities like the anonymity in the face. This is not uh, designed to be a specific person. Um, you know, we're missing the limbs and the focus is on the body, which for females is very voluptuous, right? Large breasts, pregnant looking stomachs. Um, many archeologists, anthropologists have argued that these are potentially symbols of um, religion, right? They may be representations of fertility goddesses. They may be um, humans attempts to communicate with the afterlife um, in hopes of getting pregnant. We call this sympathetic magic um, where you kind of, if you build it, it will come. So if you're having trouble getting pregnant, you carve this pregnant figurine, you carry it with you, and then you will be blessed with pregnancy. Um, we are close enough to the modern ethnographic record to say that this could definitely be what this was used for because we see it in modern societies using these types of tools, carving them with a specific purpose, with a specific goal in mind. We have other animal carvings. This is another example of a step bison that was at the end of a spear thrower, similar to the one that I showed you earlier. Um, this one's made of ivory. It's about 15,000 years old. Look at how beautiful this is. All these beautiful fine lines. If you look close, there's even a tear duct and a nostril. I mean, this is a beautifully carved handle. Um, and we've seen nothing like this in any species prior to ourselves. We're starting to see a lot more cave paintings. Now, did these exist prior? Possibly, um, you know, they may not have survived. Uh, cave sites though are great um, places for preservation. And so these are the Lascaux caves. I know this isn't the best picture in the world, but I like to show it to first scale um, because these images are essentially on the roof. 
and they're very, very, very large. Um, and they're using a specific method of painting that um, took a little while to figure out. Um, and we found out how they were doing it actually by a second cave example, Peshmel in France. Um, and so what we think people did was they would chew up minerals like hematite, which is orange, red, and, and manganese oxide, charcoal, red ochre, right? Black and red and orange pigments are common um, in these uh, minerals. But then they would mix it with other minerals like biotite and feldspar, which we still use today to extend our paint. So if, you, if you're a painter, you may be familiar with these terms because they are minerals that are found that make the paint um, lay better, right? If you were to just kind of um, break up some hematite with some water, it would drip. But by adding the biotite to it, you actually make a nice thick paint that's going to stay. And the way that they're mixing these is in their mouth. So they're chewing all of this material together and then they're spitting it out a little bit at a time, which always fascinates me because imagine how long this would take and look at how are they getting these paintings up on the ceiling of the Lascaux caves at the size that they are and with such beautiful detail in some of them. Um, you know, this is also something that maybe was being done um, simply because we were making it easier to get our food. We had more and more time to, to start producing art forms like these. And that's what we chose to do apparently as a species. We have um, a pregnant animal. This is a Lascaux example. This is believed to be a pregnant horse. Um, now around this time, about 17,000 years ago, um, horses are still being eaten. They're not being ridden and um, they're starting to go extinct. And so what some um, anthropologists believe is that, again, this is sympathetic magic. And so what humans were doing, as we do in the modern ethnographic record, is we're drawing this animal how we wish it to appear. And cultures that do this are what we call animistic, meaning that they believe that everything has a spirit or a soul that can be communicated with. Um, and by drawing them, by, by doing things like these, uh, like these paintings or carvings, you may in fact be able to communicate something to those spirits like, please come back, right? Where are you going? Um, the anxiety associated with this loss of their resources was probably significant. Um, and in my cultural class, you learn that um, one of the explanations for religious behavior like this um, and beliefs like animism might in fact be to reduce anxiety about the unknown, to feel like you've got a little control over the environment. Now, um, Homo sapiens, we are also playing music. We do have a flute, 50,000 year old flute um, that we found for Neanderthals. Not as advanced as the example you're seeing here. This is a German example, um, upwards of 45,000 years old. Look at the size of the holes differ, as well as the depression around the holes. If you play a, a, an instrument like this, you know that by moving those fingers and, um, and blowing through it, you're getting different types of sounds and sound combinations. So um, we're seeing kind of very cool examples of things like bone flutes, evidence of drumsticks. Um, this is a bull roarer. Uh, this image is actually an Aboriginal one. Um, it's essentially a long piece of wood tied to a string. Uh, that's quite long so that you can swing it like this. And as you swing it, um, you're getting this roaring sound um, that's very, very powerful, uh, a, a common um, trend in Aboriginal communities and Aboriginal music, right? A deep roaring sound. Couple other cool examples here. What do you think this might be? I'm gonna give you a second. Handheld. This is artistic, not serration. This has been interpreted to be a calendar, uh, the earliest calendar, 32,000 years ago, that's marking the cycles of the moon. Now, why would we have done that? Why would humans start keeping track of days? Um, the archaeological evidence puts the development of agriculture somewhere between 10 and 15,000 years ago. Um, but I think there's some evidence and, and that, that it probably happened much earlier than that. And I think that a calendar like this is a good piece of evidence for that because it would help keep track of seasons. Um, but this would of course be relevant for um, where fruits and things that 
they have to travel long distances to get, keeping track of when those resources would be available, um, you know, monitoring births. There's a number of reasons why um, we might want to track the moon cycles in terms of gravitational pull um, for when it's okay to go out in the ocean and collect mollusks and things like that. You know, you certainly don't want to be there at high tide when it comes in very rapidly, um, but a high level of kind of forethought going on in this example. Now back to our religious discussion, um, in cultures that are animistic, there tends to be a religious leadership position called the shaman. And the shaman is the person who has this ability to transcend this world and communicate with those spirits. Um, and so this is a 13,000 year old cave painting from France that anthropologists believe to be anthropomorphic. You have kind of a human-like body, but then you have an upper body that is um, of an animal. And this might reflect the transition that happens as the shaman, quote unquote, becomes the spirit in order to communicate with them and say, hey, what's, you know, what's going on? Where are you? You know, why, why, why is there nothing to eat? Have we done something wrong? Can we change this? Um, you know, to try to ease anxieties among these populations. So speculative, of course, but certainly fascinating. Now, finally, the burials of Homo sapiens get a lot more advanced. Now, let me preface this with the fact that there are a lot of Homo sapien burials that are not advanced, um, just buried, you know, similar to how we saw with Neanderthals. Um, but there are some that have a lot left behind. So these, uh, these are Russian examples. Oh, sorry. Sometimes I feel like coffee makes me more tired. Uh, which may mean, I mean, I need to back off a little bit. Okay. So um, these, this is an individual that's buried. Notice um, the ivory bracelets, notice the headdress and hundreds of ivory beads. And keep in mind that when you're making a bead that's strung, you have to bore a hole through that bead. You have to shape that bead. And of the, the experiments that have been done in paleoanthropology to redo this, it usually takes an hour to two hours. And you have hundreds of beads here. And in the case of this last example, which are two children buried head to head, thousands of beads, that is hundreds and thousands of man hours put into creating objects, which will ultimately just be left with the dead. Now, this suggests something because of course, if we look to the ethnographic record, right? Egypt, Mesopotamia, we see cultures that are doing this and they're doing it because their beliefs say that these items go with you after death. So this may be a clear sign of religious behavior. It may be a representation of social hierarchies. We don't think that advanced social hierarchies developed until well after agriculture, thousands of years later. And yet, um, the fact that some people have these elaborate burials and others don't may suggest that there already are levels of social stratification in human societies far earlier than we thought. Um, and this is kind of fascinating, I think. Um, now, your textbook goes much further into this. It, it walks you into the Americas and our travel into um, North, Central, and South America. Um, I don't think we have enough time for that in the class, but if you're interested in that, of course, you know, continue forward with the chapters. Um, we do think in the earliest evidence of humans crossing the Bering Bridge over into North America would probably be about 15,000 years ago, and then we kind of work our way down. Um, so by 15,000 years ago, we are kind of everywhere in the world, um, a highly advanced species. Every other species is gone, and we will proliferate. Um, how were we able to do this? Why, right? Um, in our next lecture, we're gonna talk about the brain. We're gonna look at what is unique about our brain compared to other primates, compared to other humans, and see if we can answer that question. If you have questions about this material, please let me know. Um, shoot me an email, use the general forum. If I have office hours, please attend. Otherwise, I will see you for our next session. Bye.